This video right here is exactly why I didn't want to build myself a custom keyboard, because I'm already upgrading it. Satisfy your need for speed with the all-new Viper VP4300 NVMe drive. Featuring blistering fast PCIe Gen 4x4 connectivity, you'll be burning rubber with speeds of up to 7400 megabytes per second. The VP4300 also includes both an aluminum and a graphene heatsink, so you can choose the one that's right for you. Or use one on each side to double up your cooling performance. Available in capacities of up to 2 terabytes, along with 2 petabytes of write endurance, the Viper VP4300 is the ideal drive to help turbocharge your PC. Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing everyone! As always, I'm Jeff. This beautiful keyboard you see right next to me I built about a week and a half ago. And truth be told, I have been loving every single minute of using it. But as I love the keyboard so much, I figured it's already time for an upgrade to it. So I'm taking some of the advice of a lot of the comments from the last video, and I am putting in some screw-in stabilizers. One of the biggest criticisms I received when building this kit was that I used the stabilizers that came with the PCB, and apparently that's pretty much sacrilege when it comes to the mechanical keyboard community. So we are going to be swapping those out today with a set of Duroc Smoky Screw-In Stabilizers V2. The other apparent sin that I committed was not lubricating the stabilizers when I installed them into the keyboard. So I went ahead and picked up some dielectric grease so we can take care of two birds with this one stone. This should be a pretty simple video. Take the keyboard back apart, install the new stabilizers, get everything put back together, and make sure it's all lubricated and working properly. Let's get started. I was just about ready to tear this thing apart when I remembered I didn't mention one other mod that I'm making, and that is we're going to do some sound dampening in this keyboard. Now, this is not a commercial product. This is just some foam packing that I receive with, well, just about every product that I receive. This stuff is nice and thick. Uh, it looks like it's closed cell foam and should do the job very nicely without having to go on Amazon and spend $30 because, well, this has been expensive enough for me already. All right, now let's get to work. All right, first things first, let's go ahead and get some of these keycaps off of here. Again with the non-ferrous screws. And yeah, I know it's probably necessary to prevent galvanic corrosion. I understand that. Doesn't mean it's not annoying. We'll see, I do like how they hid most of the screw holes from being able to be seen from on top of the keyboard. The downside is they hid most of the screw holes, so I can't see them with the keycaps installed. <laughs> days and there's already cat hair in the bottom of this thing. <laughs> First thing I'm going to do I think is going to measure out the foam padding and lay this down in the bottom. And luckily this stuff is just built in layers so to get it the right thickness I should just be able to tear it apart like that. So that was a complete and utter failure. Uh, luckily, I remembered one source that you can find very, very thin foam panels that should work absolutely perfectly for this. And that is literally every graphics card that I've ever bought. I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner. Anyway, uh, I'm going to mark out where I need to carve out of this. And then I'm gonna take a hobby knife and hopefully get a perfectly fitting layer of foam that'll go on the bottom of my keyboard. Let's do that now. All right, 10 minutes and 24 seconds later, I have this uh, fancy little foam backer for my keyboard to hopefully provide a good amount of sound dampening. 
Now that that's done, let's go ahead and focus on getting the stabilizer swapped out and getting everything lubed up. Now for the really fun part, and that is separating the PCB from the backplate and all of the switches. Now, last time I needed to take everything back apart because I missed the stabilizer, and yes, I'm well aware I missed two more. Uh, I took out every individual switch and every keycap, and while it was time consuming, it did work pretty well, but I'm told I should just be able to literally separate the two halves. Now, putting them back together, I'm a little concerned with because I don't want to bend any of the, of the switch pins. But, let's see how this goes. Actually, so far. Ah, see, that's what I'm worried about, is a partial separation. All right. That seems to have worked fairly well. I think I'm going to take out some of the switches when I put this back together because I some of them uh, are adjustable depending on uh, how your keyboard layout is done. So I don't think I want to try to press those into place, but I think everything else I should be able to slide right back in. But for right now, let's go ahead and get the stabilizer swapped out and get the new ones all lubed up. Time lapse. All right, overall, that wasn't too difficult at all, although it was fairly time consuming. Uh, getting the washers onto these tiny little screws and then lining everything up and making sure nothing falls out, that definitely was a little bit tedious. But overall, these are all installed and doing pretty much exactly what they're supposed to do. Now you might notice I have one mismatched stabilizer on here. Uh, the problem is I forgot to count how many stabilizers I needed and simply bought a kit that included four 2U stabilizers and then two different space bars. Uh, I needed five 2U stabilizers. So this one's gonna have to stay with the old silver clip-in model, but that's just gonna be my plus key. So I'm really not too concerned about that. Moving on to lubrication of these. Uh, I went to the hardware store and picked up the only dielectric grease they had in stock. Uh, this is the only grease that I could find that was not petroleum based, which would eventually eat through the plastics in here. So I'm just going to take a little dab of this. I'm going to drop it right onto kind of each corner. And just make sure it works its way through. Pretty simple. That should be all I need to do. Alright, you can all get off my back now. Kidding. Uh, overall, that was not difficult at all. Uh, I mean, it went together just like the regular stabilizers did. This time we just screwed them in from the back. Uh, I'm actually surprised at the difference that I can tell, especially on the larger keys, the space bar and the enter key in particular. Uh, over on the number pad, I don't really notice that much of a difference on the two vertical keys, the, the enter key and the plus sign over here. Uh, obviously, the plus sign is still using the old style stabilizers. The enter key is using the new stabilizer. There's not much of a difference between them, but in the larger keys with a little bit more weight to them, uh, it definitely does a better job holding them level through the entire stroke. And I have to say, I did not think that adding a very thin layer of foam to the bottom of this case would make that much of an acoustical difference considering I'm using a uh, slab of aluminum for a chassis, but this thing sounds so much better now. 
Here, I'll just do a quick comparison side by side to the same exact switch in two different chassis. So here is the Gateron Green in the custom keyboard versus the Gateron Green in the non-custom keyboard. It is so much tinnier and honestly, the tin on this key press was driving me absolutely nuts. But now this is just, it's exactly the sound that I wanted it to be. It's very Model M-like. Especially that enter key. Ah, I can't get enough of that enter. Ah, so good. So I know overall this video was pretty short and sweet, but don't worry, we will be getting back into some pretty major server projects before too long, including hopefully getting into the vGPU consumer hack that was released just a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, if you want any links to any of the parts that I used in this keyboard, I will have affiliate links down in the video description. Go give those a look. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Floatplane. Links are both down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. I don't need to build another one. But seriously, just listen to the difference. It's so good. I don't need to build another keyboard. I don't need to build another keyboard. I don't need to build another keyboard. Ooh. I might need to build another keyboard. I have a long history of pairing my beers to the products that I'm reviewing, and this one could not be more perfect. From Binary Brewing, this is the Ducking Autocorrect West Coast IPA. Uh, absolutely had to pick this up as soon as I saw the label. 6.8%. Wow, very, very juicy on the nose. Like that's not a citrus, that's more, I almost wanna say like a strawberry or a rhubarb. See if it changes once it's in the glass. That is a good looking beer though. <laughs> okay, it's a much grassier aroma now that it's in the glass. It's really weird though. Yeah, I'm almost getting like a fruit out of the can but a much more recognizable hop when it's in the glass. Interesting. This is a good, good West Coast IPA. This has nearly everything that I want out of a West Coast IPA. And in fact, it's got a couple extra flavors that are kind of teasing their way into the middle of it. Uh, first off, great, great hop profile on this one. Uh, I don't know. A blend of Cascade Centennial and Amarillo hops harmonize into tapestry of orchard fruits and evergreen. I nailed it then because, like I said, the can smells like strawberry or apple or, you know, some definitely not citrus fruit, which kind of threw me for a loop for a bit. But if that's the flavors they were going for, they absolutely nailed it. And now that I'm thinking apple and orchard fruits, I'm actually tasting that right at the, right on the tip of my tongue. But while it leaves you with uh, this very, very bitter, oily, clingy kind of feeling that a lot of thicker West Coast IPAs will, there's also this wonderful malt right in the center of it that really sweetens everything up. So you've got like this apple or strawberry on the front. You've got this really rich malt in the center of it. And then on the outro, you have very much like a, a stone, not even their, their base stone IPA, but like a, a Fear Movie Lions IPA or something like that. This one's good.